You're listening to the Personal Mastery Podcast with Ari Baga. Interviewing CEOs and executives who are performing at the highest level in their industry. Those who are living and working purposefully towards a vision in alignment with their values and in a state of constant learning about the self. Welcome to the first episode of the Personal Mastery Podcast. I am super excited to introduce you to our first guest. He's a super busy guy, but he was nice enough to give us an hour of his time today. We have Matt Higgins on the show. Matt is a recurring shark on ABC Shark Tank. He's an operator. He's an investor. He's a CEO of RC Ventures, a private investment firm that invests in brands across sports, technology, media, and consumer goods. He has invested in brands like Lola, Magic Spoon, and Pizza, and many other brands across the direct-to-consumer e-commerce space. And in today's episode, we're going to talk about what it takes to be an entrepreneur, what the e-commerce landscape looks like over the coming years, and how to run your business successfully post-COVID-19. We have a lot of content for you today. I'm super excited for you to check out this episode. So without further ado, here's Matt. Matt, welcome to the show. All right. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Well, a lot of people know you as this super successful guy um, and everybody and in the entrepreneurship space, everybody look at you and they just think that uh, you either grew up rich uh, or you got money from your family or whatever. Uh, but you didn't grow up rich, did you? I wish I had. <laughs> <laughs> I don't romanticize my own struggle. No, um, quite the opposite. I grew up in Queens, New York. I'm product of a okay. single mother. And mm-hmm. uh, we grew up really uh, dirt poor. I've told this story before, but, uh, mm-hmm. you know, it's sort of government cheese in the refrigerator and just trying to make ends meets and going to food pantries on the weekends. But uh, um, so, uh, you know, tough beginnings, but amazing mom who really tried to make something out of her life. She got her GD when, she, when we were growing up and went back to college and, but um, she had all these health problems that were compounding while she was trying to claw her way out of desperation. And um, things got really progressively worse when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. And uh, I made a really unconventional decision. This is before it was cool. And like Mark Zuckerberg dropped out of college and things like that, like back, (laughs) big deal. I I dropped out of high school. I got left back two years in a row. And I did it for a very specific reason. There was an arbitrage in the system that I wanted to take advantage of, which is, if you could drop out and do well enough on the GED, you can go to almost any college in America. Now it's a loophole that most people wouldn't take advantage of. Probably made these mm-hmm. colleges feel really good about themselves, you know, to say, yeah. sure, you can come here. <laughs> but I thought if I could make that one move, I could go yeah. from making three seventy-five an hour scraping gum underneath chairs at McDonald's or five bucks an hour working at a deli in Queens to doubling my salary. And everyone mm-hmm. said, you're crazy, you're gonna be a loser forever but I had had a plan, which I always tell people, it all starts with a plan. Like if you have a plan, most people don't have a plan. If you have a plan, you'll be okay, right? It's just everything in life needs to be intentional. My plan was drop out, go to college, and then I'll clean up the fact that I was high school dropout because I'll put in my time. And I did that. I went back to my high school prom a year later as, you know, captain of the debate team and (laughs) working, working, making 10 bucks an hour. And that was the first time I sort of really learned to trust my inner voice, which I talked to yeah. entrepreneurs a lot about. I think we have a tendency to place a premium on the wisdom of others without first asking yourself, what do I know? What have I mm-hmm. learned? You know what I mean? And just because I haven't real built, uh, built to last good to great, the tipping point, any of these other great books, yeah. doesn't mean that I don't have something. And because I think the most important thing in our lives is context and we know what we're capable of. So that was the first time I did kind of something a little unconventional. And it really set in motion my entire career. Yeah. Yeah. So that's one of the biggest things that I learned in my entrepreneurship journey too, is that if, as long as you have a plan, everything ends up working out. It doesn't matter like what the situation is, as long as you just take that first step and you know what the additional steps are, everything ends up falling into place. Right. I think it's a two components. One is to have a plan and, and two is to believe that the mere act of persisting is to prevail mm-hmm. ultimately. To go one more day is to go yet another day and another day. And before you know it, it's seven days in a week. And then before you know it, it's 30 days, right? Like it's just to sort of survive. 
and I think a combination of plan and that survival instinct, people don't realize that that's what differentiates the winners from the losers, right? Is the ones who just kind of kept going, which is so crazy, right? Because you think it should be about more than that. And then when, yeah. you, when you live life enough and you just get your butt off the floor, I won't curse on your podcast, but like <laughs> you just, uh, life has brought me to my knees a few times. I had, you know, testicular cancer, got, you know, had to go through that surgery. A lot of things have been thrown my way. By all means, I'm not complaining. I've had a blessed mm -hmm. life. But I've noticed that if I just keep going, things kind of work out, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And from like the point where you did um, go back to school uh, and then did you end up going to college after high school? I did. I went to college. I enrolled in Queens College as a 16 year old. Uh, wow. And uh, I was working two jobs, this, that, and the other thing, still screwing up from time to time, but mostly work and whatnot. And it took me seven years to graduate. And then I knew, like, I don't want this to be my legacy. Like, under different circumstances, I could have gone to, you know, had a different educational path. And I also knew that mm -hmm. there is a stigma with dropping out of high school, right? I didn't want to have to have an asterisk against my name for the rest of my life. Yeah. <laughs> and I think the easiest way to explain it would just be, I might as well go to a law school and be a lawyer, right? So I went to, I said, I'm going to go to the best possible law school I can while working. So Fordham Law has the second best night program in the country. I went to Fordham Law at night, four years, law review, the whole bit. And then as soon as I graduated, I decided I never want to be a lawyer a day in my life. And that was the end of my legal career. So I have, I have a beautiful piece of paper on my wall. It cost me a couple hundred thousand dollars. Uh, but at least I don't have to say I'm a high school dropout entirely anymore. I'm a lawyer too. So, you know, but hey, that's the price you pay for an unconventional decision, right? I yeah. had to go ahead and clean it up. And that's what I did. Yeah, I, I didn't drop out of high school, but I did drop out of college. Uh, I also went to college at 16. Uh, so that was yeah, that's because smart. That's because you yeah. seem smart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I but I was kind of yeah. You were gifted. I mean, yeah. Either way, like I think I didn't really like it because like even like at the age of sixteen, there's like not much you could do in college. Like it was kind of probably like the worst experience I've had because like like you like students would like go out to like outings and like you can't even go anywhere because I wasn't eighteen. I remember we went to like a trampoline park and I couldn't even like get in. And I was like, what am I doing here? I'm like only like barely 17. Um, so that was like my college experience uh, and ended up uh, dropping out as well. So. Well, I think it's really important like hitting upon what you said, like you have to know thyself, right? Like uh, there are these, we don't even realize that we subscribe to these systems and these rules and we do them subconsciously and no one ever gives us a choice. Would you like yeah. to submit to a system where you are presumed to do this, you know? And so the, there's like a regression to the mean happening all around of us where most of the systems and structures and rules are set up for the average experience, but it's yeah. not for your specific experience. And I think we all need to be a little bit comfortable and be like, what works for me? Just because conventional wisdom works for the majority, it, it may mm -hmm. not work for me. And I think you have to be comfortable with the idea that you may not fit in in a great way, right? Like, so for me, yeah. it wasn't like this conventional wisdom trajectory was to go do four years of high school. Like, how am I going to do four years of high school when my mother is like <laughs> sick in the other room and I'm working at night at a deli carrying a butterfly knife because I feel like I'm going to get jumped? Like, it doesn't mm -hmm. quite work. <laughs> so yeah. I said, I'm good for you for knowing yourself and be like, this doesn't work for me. Um, now, there are certain biases that are wired into society that you either can you know, overcome them or you just deal with them. So for me, I knew there is a stigma associated with me making that decision. So, all right, I'll have to compensate by, you know, getting a law degree, small price to pay yeah. for doing it my way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So after you uh, stopped being a lawyer, what, what did you end up doing? Did you get in business or did you go back to working? I, uh, I, uh, I never, I never ever practiced and mm -hmm. I just considered, continued what I was doing. I've been working for the government at the time. I ended up, uh, I was the you know youngest press secretary of New York at the time. And then, um, I was there on nine 11 and I, uh, helped oversee the rebuilding of the world trade center site for two years. And then mm -hmm. I decided to transition out of government into sports, uh, hold multiple jobs at the New York jets, uh, mm -hmm. help build the stadium, everything. And then, you know, but I had this burning desire. I feel really comfortable in a state of chaos, you know, planned chaos. Yeah. Uh, it's not like I'm an adrenaline junkie, but I do love to build things from scratch and like just figure out how to create something out of nothing. And mm -hmm. I'm not as comfortable 
involved in something in a steady state, if that makes sense. It doesn't best take yeah. advantage of my skill sets, right? Since I've been architecting everything with my hands since I started as a kid. So I knew mm -hmm. I wanted to support entrepreneurs, be an entrepreneur. I had all these ideas and, and uh, I ended up partnering up with Steve Ross on what is now RSC and helping back entrepreneurs build companies. And one of the best moves I ever made in my life is uh, I met this uh, crazy guy named Gary Vaynerchuk at a, at a bagel store. Um, <laughs> and he was gesticulating, predicting the future and, and whatnot. And uh, I was like, you know what? This, this guy does like have a lot to say and really does see how things are going to play out. And yeah. uh, we did a deal to give him four Jets tickets to become the first client of VaynerMedia. And then I went back, <laughs> I went back three years later with Steve Ross and I, we, uh, and we bought into the firm and we've been partners ever since. So mm -hmm. I do think that's kind of hopefully part of my legacy has been able to recognize greatness in others and mm -hmm. submit to it, you know, and help yeah. them realize their full potential. Yeah. So you did invest in Gary V very early on. So I wanted to ask you, like, is it because you saw that digital was going to be the way that businesses are going to be marketing or was it that you saw something in Gary V that you wanted to uh, really invest in? That's a great question. I think it's both. I think I saw, uh, I would say that because he was immersed and being a practitioner and yeah. making content and early on that he could spot the patterns. Life, success in life is all about pattern recognition when you break it down. It's about execution too, but it's about recognizing the pattern so that you could skate to where the puck is going before anybody else does, right? And mm -hmm. I always say opportunity arises before evidence, so you have to have the courage to go for it early on. <clears throat> and Gary made a lot of predictions, and one of them in that bagel store in 2009 was that the proliferation of smartphones is gonna enable everyone to be a content creator. You're gonna be NBC and HBO, and Comcast yep. all at one. And that's gonna open up tremendous opportunities, but big companies are like battleship carriers and they're not gonna be nimble enough to take advantage of it. So me and my little brother, AJ, we're gonna create a company where we're gonna help them <laughs> figure it out. Like, so I'd say that the, the, the idea made sense, right? <laughs> but also yeah. the idea that Gary was always gonna sit in the stream of information meant that he was always gonna have remarkable insights about where the world was going. And having somebody like that in your corner and your partner is going to take you to places you never dreamed, right? So, you know, even like the LinkedIn, Gary was telling me two years ago, like, you're making a mistake. You should be investing in LinkedIn. Like, that is the most viral platform. It's going to be massive. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. I don't like the color first. I don't, I don't, like, the, I don't like the UI, you know? I don't feel like doing it. And then fast forward two years, I was like, oh, 700 million subscribers are completely right. And I love LinkedIn. I spent a lot of time on it. So... I think like, it's a comedy. It, usually, I know it's cliche, but you really do back the jockey first because the jockey mm -hmm. will take you to great places, whereas an yeah. idea can only take you so far. Right? And I've been hurt way more backing a great idea with a founder that didn't have the wherewithal to bring it to life than the other way mm -hmm. around. I've never regretted backing a great founder with a, with a weak idea. Um, so... Since investing in Gary V, I'm assuming that, that it didn't go bad. Gary V is now very popular. Everybody <laughs> knows who Gary V is and uh, has been able to grow that company and multiple other companies through his company, VanderMedia. Um, so, and now you're also investing in a lot more D2C brands and a lot of brands within the sports space and consumer space and all kinds of companies. Um, and you're also a shark on Shark Tank. Uh, my f question is like, how did Shark Tank even happen? A great, uh, great question. Um, kind of like everything I'd, I've done in my life, I sort of just had yeah. to will it. You know, I, I always love when people say, you know, wow, you've been so lucky. I'm like, I have. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even know what the word luck means. In fact, I feel like it's a pejorative, like you're insulting me. Because, yeah. you know, whenever you try to deconstruct luck, there's a yeah. lot of intentionality happening. Like, I suppose luck technically means like happenstance for which there's no explanation, right? Like, so mm -hmm. I, I wanted to be on Shark Tank. I love the show. I bond on the show with my son. I feel like it's what I do all day long. I don't watch mm -hmm. a lot of TV. I barely watch any TV. It's like Breaking Bad, Sopranos, Shark Tank, you know, like they're a little house yeah. in a prairie, you know, it's like big gaps between what I watch. And so I love Shark Tank. And um, I, I, I reached out to this guy, Reed Bergman, who's like the Shark Tank whisperer. And he's mm -hmm. an amazing friend of mine. He, he got me a courtesy meeting on the set of Sony Studios for like a fifth, what was supposed to be a 15 minute meeting with a gentleman named Clay, who's the executive producer. 
and 15 minutes turn into 30 and it turns into an hour and turns into two. And it's kind of like got Eminem playing in my mind. Like, I'm not going to waste my shot. No, that's Hamilton. Yeah. Uh, you know, like <laughs> you only get one shot, you know what I mean? And so, and from that moment, I probably had multiple meetings over the course of a year. Like you don't just go on shark tank, right? It's a, there's yeah. an alchemy for them deciding to give you an opportunity. And they gave me an opportunity to do a couple of episodes and I, I held my own, which was a blast. Very intimidating, yeah. incredibly intimidating. Uh, and then they brought me back and now I'm like a member of the family, you know, come, come in, come out here and there. But I, but yeah. I love being part of it. And I love, I love the journey of transcendence. I love the idea that um, there's no ceiling on our heads and that no one never let anybody put you in a box. So that yeah. show to me is watching people in real time, trying to break out of the box that they either put themselves in or somebody else did. Right. And uh, I think that's amazing. It's, gl it's glorious. Yeah. Uh, I've been watching some of the episodes and I saw you uh, invest in some businesses and uh, really went back to back uh, with Mr. Wonderful, which was pretty awesome. Uh, <laughs> yeah. He's a, not to ruin his shtick. He's actually kind of a great guy. He's a lot of fun. You know, yeah. I like that you know where you stand, right? Like as anybody mm -hmm. in business knows, the best thing you can give somebody is a no or honesty. The worst mm -hmm. is like a fake maybe think maybe just gives you false hope waste your time and ends up hurting your self-esteem later knows you'd yep. be like whatever i'll prove you wrong goodbye thank you yeah <laughs> you know? so i like i like that kevin always tells me to understand oh yeah 100 percent, and i definitely prefer that and some of my friends like really don't like me for doing that when they ask me something and i'm just like yeah maybe that's not like a good idea uh so like the idea of like not sugarcoating anything it's always end up like that you might hurt that person's feelings but you're actually helping them Agreed. Yeah. You know, you just, uh, you're not, it's very hard to learn a few things. It's hard to learn how to be intentional with your time yeah. and it's hard to say no. It's hard to realize that being no is being kind. And also you have a right to decide how to use your time. It's your most precious resource and it's a wasting resource. Right. So like mm -hmm. I, I, I do struggle with it too, because I get asked a lot, you know, can you, will you mentor me? Like, can you meet, let's just grab a, I'll buy you a cup of coffee. It's like, I mean, how, you know, like I'm, <laughs> I'm dying too, just like you. So that's tough. I always tell people when you're, when you have a business and you have, you want some advice or help from somebody, ask them a very discreet question that can help get you to the next place. Mm -hmm. Don't, don't make the bar so high that it's not realistic. Right. That's, it's like a waste of interaction. Right. Instead say, all right, here's my dilemma. Can you give me, you know, two sentences on it? That's something that most people would want to do. It feels good. Right. But I always find that people waste the opportunity when they have your attention by asking you to do something that you're just not gonna be able to do, right? Because yeah. everyone is drowning. And the problem with technology is that it's made us, uh, you know, completely bonded in ways that we don't want to be to, to our phones and email. So I don't know anybody, no one's become more efficient. They've just become more occupied, right? So you have even less time to be generous with your time. But I always feel bad about that. So I like when somebody gives me a discreet question, say, hey, mm -hmm. like, uh, real quick you know what do you think yeah and like through the shark tank I've, uh, I've found out that you've been really interested in the d2c space um we're actually having you uh how we connected was like you your team reached out to get you to speak at dtc day uh the largest conference for direct to consumer uh brands uh you're also teaching at harvard business school about d2c uh what about that space or the e-commerce space is uh really uh, call your interest. Look, I love uh, I love e-commerce generally. Mm -hmm. I feel like I've had a front row seat to it uh, for a variety of reasons. My partnership with Gary and VaynerMedia, watch it go from nothing to large company, you know, well north of 150 million revenue. And so I've seen that. Through, I have a partnership with a uh, Jesse Darris, who uh, communications branding firm that has been on day one on some of the most incredible startups uh, of the last you know seven years. And so. Uh, I've watched that process, those early pitch decks for hymns and, you know, Glossier on and on. And so, um, so we're, in, we're, uh, through my partnership with Jesse, we're invested in a lot of great DTC brands. And the genesis of the HBS class was this notion that, um, a lot of the assumptions around DTC hadn't really been updated from the Warby Parker era, right? A lot had changed. Uh, I'm taking you back a year. A lot had changed over that decade and I would meet new founders who had these gaps in their competency that I thought this should, and they had gone and they had spent a couple hundred grand of business school. And I thought yeah. you really could have learned this, you know, and 
it's a shame that you sort of don't know that and you don't need to make this mistake. Like the, the information is out there. And, and I thought, wouldn't it be amazing if you could put together an intensive program in an academic institution that really could take people through the DTC journey, but updated for 2019, 2020, right? Like, so uh, uh, this wonderful, amazing professor at HBS named Len Schlesinger, uh, who's a giant, intellectually and otherwise, um, and he, he, we, we partnered up on it and made an incredible class over a, a one week period. We had 22 classes, 30 visitors, and it's called Moving Beyond DTC. And the whole point was to demonstrate the evolution to what is effectively an omni-channel strategy that like, look, no one, no one, you may start launch DTC. It's basically a launch vertical, but you're going to, to be successful, need to become omni-channel. What does that really mean? And so we approached it from really every angle to Amazon or not to Amazon. You know, what does it mean to have a retail strategy? Do you, you know, have your dedicated stores or you go into a neighborhood goods or a show fields? And so it was a phenomenal class. I like to think very valuable. And then COVID happens. <laughs> so, yeah. okay, time to do moving beyond our own class to create yeah. an entirely new class, which is what we're working on right now, which is amazing. Like, cause it's where it's all happening in real time. Just trying to figure out, okay, what, what does the future hold for this space? Uh, yeah, I heard uh, Harvard is, they're moving all their classes online for the next calendar year, correct? Yeah, I don't know what the exact, you know, blend, but uh, ours is certainly be a hybrid and uh, ours takes place in January between the uh, mm -hmm. first and second semester. So I'm actually looking forward, to be honest, I feel like it's a new skill set. How yeah. do you teach? First, becoming a teacher uh, was like, completely uncomfortable for me and I'd love to do something very uncomfortable. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> every at any moment in time i'm doing something very uncomfortable so that was very uncomfortable but now i get to be uncomfortable learning how to do it virtually so i'm really excited yeah. about it. but i like to think i hope that the legacy of the course is that we're providing this tremendous insights into the space and like even mm -hmm. customer acquisition right the way it's morphed uh even in a post-covid era and really moving away from you know pure facebook and like you're not going to build a business on cac arbitrage right like um, to other inventory that's performing pretty well, like podcast inventory and whatnot. Like the class gets hyper granular while also being big picture and doing some great original case studies. We did an original case study on Small Direct. Mm -hmm. I brought in a gentleman named Sabir, who's, who's an Amazon hacking god. And he talked <laughs> about the tactics that go into it and how, how, these, how a brand should approach the decision matrix on whether to be on Amazon or not, although that seems even outdated now since everyone is but uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, i really love it i love the dtc space what i love about it now is it it's in a COVID year it's now become so important right i mean yeah the the i don't know who these last holdouts were who weren't shipping things overnight on amazon but they're gone now right so mm -hmm. that's, that behavior is a permanent shift which really opens the door for a lot of opportunity for people and i don't even think we've scratched the surface yet about what that really means uh for companies but it's going to be huge, bigger than it was before. Yeah. Uh, and you talk, uh, uh, pre-COVID, you kind of also talk about why brands should not only rely on DTC and that they should also go retail because that's how you scale. Uh, with things changing now, uh, with retail stores, like thousands of retail stores closing, DTC has become the business. Um, and we've seen like Shopify talking about how now, just today, they've been like, experiencing black friday like traffic every single day since like march um so like what do you kind of see like through your portfolio companies like what is black friday gonna look like um are you what are you guys doing to like prep for that that's great great questions and i, I a few points one i let's start about what the, the fundamental premise of, of of a dtc brand having physical touch points Mm -hmm. Great study at MIT in 2015 about, I think it was Bonobos maybe, um, and just how this notion of uh, supercharging and how when you have a physical touch point, it drives a few behaviors. One, your return rates are lower, right? Because you got to touch the brand and you kind of, your expectations are calibrated. So mm -hmm. you, you know, so therefore you're less likely to return. Demonstrated that the long-term value of a customer acquired through that channel was much higher. So, so fast forward post COVID, is there a reason why that phenomenon would necessarily change? I don't think so. I think the question is, how will brands manifest themselves in a post-COVID era? Like, I don't know what the retail model will look like. I don't know how mm -hmm. many of you out there know about Showfields, but Showfields is a great magical experience. It's experiential retail, five floors, 
on Bond Street in New York that, uh, you know, DTC brand could have, you know, 50 square feet and taking these great brands and bringing them out into the real world. Is that the model? Is there some kind of, you know, master leasing of space within a, you know, uh, what used to be known as a mall? And that's how, you know, so I'm not really sure. I do know that the, uh, you need a, you'll, the idea that you want a physical touch point probably won't go, go away. What I'm seeing is numbers are extraordinary uh, with uh, brands. I have seen on, 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 on e-commerce, I have seen uh, CAC actually has come down, which is interesting because I wasn't sure, you know, would, would there be tremendous inflation? There are still great arbit arbitrage opportunities. I think yep. the danger, you know what I think the danger is looking ahead? that uh, everybody gets a little bit lazy, that it kind of came easy and the numbers yeah. look great. And then you try to raise against it because you make, the same way I saw brick and mortar, some of my businesses were making unrealistic assumptions that the pandemic would end in three months. Remember that? It was yeah. like a three month time yep. frame. Literally was three months. It'll be three months. I remember one of our businesses has, you know, walk the line is going to return by June. And I remember, I remember being like, what if we're like really screwed? Like, what if this isn't going to for long? So let's flip that on its head. DTP yeah. businesses, what if you make the assumptions that like the good times are going to roll forever, you know? And I think yeah. eventually cost, acquisition costs go up, but also eventually the world will open back up again. So I would say that's sort of one flag, but the numbers really are extraordinary. So my, my overall arching advice is I don't think the need for an omni-channel uh, strategy is going to go away, but I don't think you need to commit to what it looks like just now, right? You just have to be mindful of it and, mm -hmm. uh, and make sure that your planning doesn't assume that, that in a post-COVID era, the steady state of e-com is an unrealistic assumption. Does that make, does that make sense? Yeah. It's uh, easy to do that, right? It feels so good. And, and, so, and three, you know, don't get lazy, right? It's not, yeah. not always, it's not always going to be this easy. This easy. Yeah, I think retail is going to definitely be important. And uh, we're seeing now like platforms are starting to incorporate retail, uh, if, like platforms are a DTC first, uh, allowing people to be able to shop online and pick up in store. Um, and I think that's something that's going to, uh, brands are going to adopt that first uh, as more businesses open up. Uh, and eventually, like, I mean, like people always say like, they're, they're, they're just going to shop online. They're never going to go in store. Uh, and I just say like, let's wait until things open up. Like people are always going to go in store. Like shopping is something that it's an experience. It's something that people like doing, uh, especially here in the U S that's why there are like so many shopping malls and so many thousands of st stores everywhere. Um, so yeah, that's something that we're just going to have to wait. That's not going to change. The thing that will get accelerated is, is the demand that it be a differentiated experience. That's yeah. really it. I mean, so, but I agree with you. We like, we, we are social creatures, right? Like we, this is what I learned from 9-11 that there were a lot of predictions and I put them in two buckets. There were the fear-based predictions, right? And then mm -hmm. there were the recovery predictions and fear-based predictions were, we're never going to be in a tall building again because we're afraid. We're never going to yeah. congregate because we're afraid, right? And then there were recovery predictions, which is security on airlines are going to get really tight. You know, like there is going to, we're really going to end up making sure we're never attacked again. Right? Like, so similar to COVID, I think the fear-based predictions around, we're not going to want to shop. We're not going to want to go to restaurants, all that stuff. We fortunately we're resilient little creatures, us humans, and we have a yep. short memory and we get over trauma very quickly. But, but I do think the legacy of this is even a greater desire for a exquisite experience in retail. So retail is not going to be able to just have a big box and think they're going to get people's dollars because there are so many more people now who are willing to opt for a frictionless experience. So the key is retail has to be adequately differentiated to make me abort the frictionless experience of ordering online. That was mm -hmm. case pre COVID, but now it's like accelerated dramatically, which, and you know what the exciting part is? I always say this, it's similar to yourself and your personal life. When life brings you to your knees, you have a yeah. lot more will freedom to maneuver because you have nothing left. And yeah. like same with retail and brick and mortar. We've all been devastated. So now's the time that some really clever creative developers out there or owners or, or entrepreneurs are going to experiment. And we're going to be like, that's amazing. Like that's what it yeah. should look like. Right. So I don't know what it looks like yet though. <laughs> so yeah. I don't think, I don't think we need to, I think we just need to watch, listen, learn. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and I think a lot of good things came out of like retail stores shutting down. We saw like companies, like a lot of the big brands launching the direct consumer uh, sites within like weeks. Whereas before, like they would get pitched by like these marketing agencies and then they're just like keep talking for like years and never launch anything. 
and when COVID happened, they launched so fast. Uh, so that was like really great to see as well. Well, I love, that's what I think is one of the permanent legacy of COVID, which is fascinating. Let's catalog all the things that we did only four months ago that we yeah. will never do again. Isn't it incredible? Like we had zoom four months ago. It's just nobody under the age, over the age of like 35 <laughs> was using it. And you know, we didn't necessarily need to get on an airplane to do a meeting like that could have been done via zoom, zoom. but we did yeah. anyway. Like, and we really didn't need to have everybody in the same geography, but the, there were some commodity people like myself who thought everyone needs to work from the office, right? Like mm -hmm. those things are forever gone. So now put yourself in the, maybe let's look at a DTC startup, right? You could like have a product and, and put together a tremendous presentation and look like you are quite real without having mm -hmm. an office, without having ever met your virtual team, you know, yeah. without ever getting on an airplane. So the time to ramp of innovation is going to be so dramatically truncated that this is going to create an era of explosive innovation once we stabilize, right? And we will stabilize again. We'll stabilize, I think, by next spring. And so I'm excited to see this era of innovation and growth. And I'm also excited to see humanity back at the center of the story, you know? And what I mean by that is like, we've all, myself included, have opened our eyes to a better way of living. And yeah. really what we value more, I've been able to be around my children more. I've commuted less. I'm happier. I'm not happy about the state of the world, but I'm happier about, um, about just the, the organization of my life. And so mm -hmm. I, think, I think that when we emerge from it, we will be smarter, faster, more nimble, more innovative, and we will place a premium on quality of life. Because I don't know about you, but I don't know anybody who's like, I want to go back to the way things were. Yeah. I, miss, I really miss sitting on a subway for an hour and not seeing my children and flying across the country for a meeting that got canceled you know, a couple hours before, because that was great. Yeah. <laughs> so... so I hope we should all like, we need to have a referendum where we all vote so we can yeah. lock these games in. You know, nobody better take this away from us. That's what I yeah. worry about. Don't you try to make us go back. You know uh, what I mean? <laughs> like, let's lock in the gains we have made collectively and let's decide yep. how we live our lives better. You know, and, yep. that, and that should, we should all, that should all, that should inert the benefit of society long term. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm also like being really optimistic about it because I've seen people be a lot happier being able to like spend time with family or now working remotely, people are able to like not like live in like one city or they can, they can move out of the city if they would like. Uh, you see now that people are like wanting to, you know, live in different cities, like before you can do that because you're tied to your job, which is at a specific location. Um, so that's been like really great to see that uh, people want to do more stuff. Right. And I think we need to have an honest dialogue to mitigate the down. Here's the danger. There's going to be, there's already a little bit of a backlash against it. You know, yeah. like, Oh, work from home doesn't work. And you know, that's an overstatement as well. What yeah. it is is that it's not like we all collectively decided what, how we're going to do it according to best practices. There are casualties of a hundred percent work from home planet. And some yeah. of them are <laughs> lack of intimacy and cross pollination. So any work from a home hybrid model needs to allow for congregation, right? And for everybody to come together and fellowship and mm -hmm. cross pollination in some rhythm, right? And so maybe that means that our office environments are restructured to allow people to like the we works of of uh, you know of, of plenary halls where everybody gets together and they're in one place. So yeah. that's one thing that doesn't work. I feel like younger people in their career miss out because they're not getting the mentorship. Um, so that's tough, right? Because they're not getting yep. you know, feedback. And then I think generally it's harder for employees' work to be seen. So there's that. There's Zoom mm -hmm. fatigue. I call it the tyranny of Zoom. Like, why do I have to do a Zoom call? Why is everything an effing Zoom call? Like, like yeah. we can do a conference call. It's okay. And then I can get my 10,000 steps in. So stop yeah. terrorizing me. So... Yeah, but you know what? Those are marginal. And what I'm showing, I'm seeing it creep in a little bit because we like to be contrarian. I'm seeing the pendulum swinging backwards with, oh, it turns out this mass social experiment of working from home didn't work. I was like, that's not the case. It's that we didn't collectively embrace best practices. So what I don't want to do is like there to be reflexively, we lose the great gains that we've gotten, the insights that we've gotten during the COVID period. And we revert back to the way things were because that's a shame. It's a more innovative world you know, right now that we're operating. But there is collateral damage that we need to mitigate around depression, isolation, lack of idea sharing. It's very hard to ideate on a Zoom call. So, but those are details. You and I could sit for in two hours on a whiteboard. We'll figure yeah. out society. <laughs>
Yeah. Now you're a shark. Uh, do you get pitched a lot? Do you get pitched everywhere you go? I do. <laughs> I mean, it's tough. I don't. Well, the toughest part is I'm getting pitched 98% on early stage and I don't do early stage outside yeah. of Shark Tank or outside my partnership with Jesse Darris on DTC specifically. And so in those early stage, even still are not pre product, you know, they're early traction. So mm -hmm. series a, you know what I mean? I mean, and like, we're, we're in the first round of hymns, right? Like, uh, you know, year and a half ago. Um, so I get 95% are pitching things that I wouldn't invest in. So that's always tough. I get pitched yeah. a lot of times people, frankly, wanting me to like go on a rescue mission. Like I have a great idea. I've done nothing <laughs> for it. I would like you to do the work. Would you like to do that? I, it's a great idea. It's a huge multi-billion dollar market. I'm like, <laughs> like, cause writing a check, people don't realize writing a check is actually enlisting uh, in someone else's war and, mm. or mixing metaphors, <laughs> signing up for another job. So like, yeah. as soon as you write that check, unless you don't really care about your money, you are yep. signing up for a job and you're not only signing up for a job, you're making a commitment to be there to answer the phone every so often to be emotionally invested in somebody else's problems. And like, that's a very heavy commitment. So I don't take it lightly. So I get pitched all the time, which I love, I mean, generally, and I love, you know, giving advice to founders, but you know, the challenge with everything is scale. I have a big portfolio of companies that have been hard hit by COVID. So a mm -hmm. lot of my energy rightfully so is devoted to my portfolio and helping people I have. So trying not to be scattered and all over the place and doing new deals. I'm mostly watching, waiting, learning and focusing on fixing, you know, what, mm -hmm. what is broken right now uh, as I should yeah. be. So I think probably most of us with a big portfolio of like, the peripheral vision is on opportunity, but their line of sight is on their portfolio and fixing what isn't working. Mm -hmm. And for the brands that are severely um, hit by COVID, um, is there like certain advice that you would give them or certain way of approaching uh, th these problems that you've used that have been working? Yeah, I, I look at it in segments of time, right? And when, uh, when COVID first struck, uh, the object of the exercise was to extend the burn and stay alive, right? So all the old metrics and assumptions by which you judged yourself are out the window and we need to stay alive. And yep. you need to forecast where we're going to be and make the hard decisions now, not when they're upon you. So that's hard for people to do. And, you know, a lot of people were forced to make labor changes and that was tough to come to terms with. But the ones that were most successful were the people who could predict where we were headed and get ahead mm -hmm. of it, right? And make decisions in advance. That was phase one. I think phase two was, okay, take stock, right? Like the, you know, I've seen the movie Independence Day, right? We will yep. rebuild, you know? And I think there was that defiance that we're going to build things exactly as they were. That's a mistake. It's human emotion to want to rebuild better than before, but you may end up waking up five months from now and you built a relic or an yeah. anachronism from a previous time. So it's important to make sure you're asking yourself the right question. So I feel very passionate about this. The question you should be asking, if I were building my business today from scratch, what business would I build? Not how do I build the one I had in February, right? And I think when founders and even people in our lives, we give ourselves permission to ask that question, we go from playing from a position of fear and weakness to one of strength and opportunity because it opens your eyes. Like, you know what, actually, some things weren't working very well and I wasn't mm -hmm. that happy. And I did see this opportunity, but I didn't have time to go after it. Now that a sideshow might be the main event. So that is probably my number one philosophy. And I found that our, our, the best founders kind of embrace that attitude and have really, you know, have pivoted and are managing to survive, right? When you open mm -hmm. your eyes, I believe every crisis opens an aperture to a parallel universe where things are being done differently and potentially better. So if you have faith in that concept, no matter how bad your life gets, you will scan the horizon for the aperture and you will walk through it, right? If you're not open to it, all you want to do is go back home, right? I just mm -hmm. want to go back to the way things were. But if you're like, wait, I know there's a portal or an aperture. If I could yeah. just find it, then you find it, right? And I have some things I've worked on personally and professionally I'm really excited about that are going to be the legacy of this period. And when I look back, I'd be like, I, I looked for the aperture and I walked through it and I find the best businesses are doing that. Not to get yeah. all existential on you, but I got existential on you. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks for that. And I think our listener would definitely uh, enjoy that. Now, getting more into personal things, uh, I know things have really changed over the past few months, uh, but are there like uh, certain routines or things that you do during the day that help you perform uh, at this level? I, I mean, you've been like, going at it since like 
I don't know, like 10, 12 working at McDonald's and just all, all in, right? Uh, are there like certain routines now that you think are help entrepreneurs perform at the highest level? Uh, a great question. Um, I'm not the perfect person to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> always trying to regulate myself but yeah. um i think number one is uh about being intentional i firmly believe that joy in life comes from the endless pursuit of perpetual growth right i look at everything as kind of like a circle that i keep playing out right i kind of burn the boats i go all in you know i achieve a new milestone i do it again and i think that a lot of people uh believe that there's a destination when they don't realize that life is really truly i know it's a cliche but it's a journey yeah. right your most of your day comes from the pursuit of things that are really uncomfortable and hard it doesn't come from the arrival in fact if you think about the times when you've been kind of melancholy a little bit and you can't figure out why it's usually because yeah. you're in your life is static right and you feel unchallenged and by yeah. virtue of feeling unchallenged you feel unmoored so i and maybe it's just, I'm ascribing to everybody else what works for me, but I enjoy the pursuit of perpetual growth. So, and here's how I achieve it. Whenever I have a new milestone, I ask myself, what could I do now that I couldn't do yesterday uh, that brings me closer to what I want to do tomorrow, right? Mm -hmm. So I talk to players about this all the time. Success and life and achievement is not something that takes place sequentially in like a tidy way it takes place concurrently and it's if you look at an nfl athlete perfect example average playing time four years whatever the number is right if you mm -hmm. wait and to pursue your next dream or begin uh making inroads or even determine what it is until you're done with the nfl your ability to achieve that dream actually went down exponentially because you have a lot of power in being a professional athlete the titans of the world still are humbled by your excellence your athleticism and they will take your time and Dominic and Sue, right, managed to cold call Warren Buffett, got him on the yep. phone, and Warren Buffett is his mentor. And that's how I met Warren Buffett is through Dominic and Sue. Like, like, that's extraordinary. If he had called maybe when he was a retired player, I don't know if he breaks through. Maybe Warren Buffett's different. But so my point is life is lived, successful, great achievement is achieved mm -hmm. uh, when you pursue it concurrently, not sequentially. So uh, I'm always like, all right, I achieved Shark Tank. And then I said to myself, all right, what would be even greater than that? Yeah. You know, like <laughs> what, would, what would bring me even more joy? And then I, you know, and it occurred to me, I was a little bit down for like two weeks. Like, wow. I said to my wife, who's my, my partner, my best friend in crime, like yep. she's doing, I said to her, you know, I'm, I'm a little down because I can't think of anything that would be more uncomfortable than this. I'm so, <laughs> this was so hard. And then I loved it. And I was walking through uh, Boston and then I was like, Oh my God, I want to teach. I desperately want to go, want to teach. I want to be at the, yeah. at the best. And I never got a chance when I was growing up to go to the best. And also I want to teach very badly. I have wanted to, and now's the time. And I have an idea. I'm going to go reach out to Harvard, <laughs> Harvard Business School. And I'm going, to, I'm going to make my case. And because of a great human being, Len Schlesinger, who gave me an audience, he decided that I, just like with Shark Tank, that I had what it would take to be a teacher. Um, mm -hmm. And then I did it. And so I think that's my secret. When people say, how, how'd you get on Shark Tank? How'd you... It's not how did I do any one thing, it's how did I do all things, which yeah. was to always put myself in a position of being uncomfortable and mm -hmm. to always ask myself, what can I do today that I couldn't do yesterday? And like, think about the genesis of that question. I, I discovered the question when I was 16 by saying, if I was a college student, I could get a job that I'm reading about this penny saver that says mm -hmm. it pays 950 an hour, whatever the hell it was, right? So it's what could I do then that I couldn't do today if I had the college degree, if I just drop out of high school and it seems so obvious to me and then guy, you're crazy, whatever. So I would say to anybody out there who really wants to unlock their full potential and try to figure out what the ceiling is on themselves, by the way, there is none. Um, ask yourself that question. What can I do today that I could not do yesterday? That brings me closer to what I want to do tomorrow. Now, some might say, God, that's a very discontented life. I'm not, um, I'm not unhappy. I'm really yeah. happy, but I'm happiest when I'm figuring out what else, what's, where's the ceiling on this? Like, how far can I take it? Right? Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. That's something that I had to learn the hard way too. It's like, sometimes you might, uh, whether you close a big client or whatever it is, uh, the next day it's like, okay, what's next, right? Uh, what, what can we do uh, to take it to the next level? Um, and going back to like the journey, like the journey has been just enjoying the journey alone makes you, makes you happy instead of like wanting to get the things uh, in life, just trying to 
you know, set milestones and keep working at it. Uh, and like you said, the way you do one thing is like how you do everything else. So using that same strategy of setting the intention uh, and just taking action every single day to move forward. It, like if you just write down like just a couple of things that you're going to do today and you do that every right. single day, you, you have to get there. There's no other way. Uh, to, <laughs> right. I, I will say, oh, well, that's well, that's a very like. You, you know, you never experienced the joy of the thing you achieved. You're not happy. I'm like, no, that's actually the opposite. I'm happy yeah. with the entire journey. I just, I just realized that no single achievement is ever going to fill this void because the void is the journey. So as if yeah. I surrender to the journey, then I'm in a steady state of general happiness. And the other yep. thing I do, I work on really hard is um, I work hard. I think our success becomes a prison of our own making because the further you climb, the more worried you are about losing the thing you attained. And that mm -hmm. makes you risk worse over time. So I work very hard as I become more successful to try to define what I need as narrowly as possible. So I'm not afraid to lose the new thing. Because if you're afraid to lose the new thing, eventually if so many new things, you're just like paralyzed. You're like, okay, I just yeah. want to stay still. I really don't want to screw this up. And I think you have to do the opposite. I think you have to be more yeah. willing to lose everything. The more you go, not lose, you don't have to be so dire about it, but I just think yeah. you, it, you know, you want to resist this uh, complacency, right? Unless that's, mm -hmm. I mean, again, there's no one method though. So sometimes when I talk like everything's so binary, I'm really <laughs> mostly talking about myself. So take it with yeah. salt. But I think I'm yeah. right for a number of people, you know, in this area. Yeah. Well, on that note, thank you so much for this awesome advice. Uh, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me at LinkedIn. That's where I spend a lot of time. Uh, yep. At Higgins, I'm just just an easy platform to get in touch. So find me there or matthiggins.com. Sign up for awesome. my newsletter, please. Uh, yeah. Manifest Your Mindset, where I interview guests and talk about how to bridge um, vision and insight with execution, which I think is the, right, the holy grail. If you can pull the two together, um, you can achieve great things. And it's not always easy. Like, you know, a lot of people have one or the other. And so how do you, how do you marry them both? Which I think you, you know, Jeff Bezos of the world and Elon Musk and others have been able to do. How do, how do you cultivate those, uh, that power within yourself? And I talk a lot about that on my show, Manifest Your Mindset. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll definitely leave those links uh, in the description oh, for great. people to right, check out. Um, and now, if you're listening on iTunes or Spotify, uh, this is the por uh, extras portion of this podcast where I have two extra questions for Matt and he's going to answer on youtube so if you're listening now just go on youtube to watch the rest uh, of this episode now the first question that i have for you is how do you build a profitable business in 2020 great question well still the fundamentals are still the same and in fact if anything uh yeah. because the the nature of the of the game has changed right? You're not being evaluated on growth. You're being evaluated on survival, right? So that's actually kind of liberating, right? There was a lot of yeah. pressure before to show, to be investable, you have to show this great trajectory. Now the way you stand out is by surviving and showing yeah. that you, you actually can manage. So the good part is there's a lot of clarity on what you need to do. You need to be profitable. And so you need to make sure that, you know, don't, you're not over investing in growth to go ahead and demonstrate that you have this phenomenal trajectory. You don't need to do that anymore. And I think it's a mistake if you believe that investments are going to be made on the same, uh, uh, under the same reasoning that they were pre COVID. They're not this stock market to me is nonsense. It's, it's a, it's a fiction and it will mm -hmm. come to an end and we're going to return to reason and reason is going to be businesses are going to be valued on their capacity to achieve a profit, a profit and be sustainable without needing mm -hmm. ultimately outside capital. So the answer is, is manage your business. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like control your <laughs> overhead and grow moderately, grow patiently. Don't worry about scale right now. It doesn't matter. Actually what matters is showing your ability to navigate a crisis and make the crisis your asset. Mm -hmm. uh, and the final question here is if you were to start over today, what business would you start? Wow, if I was to start over today, how long do I have to go back? I just want to know. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean right, right now I have to start? Yeah, right now. Right now. Right now. I would definitely be doing a DTC business in yep. the consumer product category 
I think there's still a lot of what I, what we call sleepy TAMs. I actually took this from Ben Lair, uh, Total Addressable Market. There mm -hmm. is always a sleepy TAM waiting for you to disrupt it. That yep. is a massive industry. So let's take cereal. I'm an investor in Magic Spoon and I love these guys, the, the, the co-founders, right? They said, you know, cereal had been growing at like 2%. Everyone sort of assumed, you know, cereals is a kind of a dead category because it's off trend. It's too sugary. Millennials yeah. don't want that. You know, even boomers, are, you know, want healthy stuff, right? But they said, well, what if we redefine cereal and we used healthy product? We made a protein-based cereal, but we made it taste really good. Um, and we used branding that was nostalgic that remind you of Lucky Charms. So mm -hmm. here was a, 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 a billion-dollar category that had been presumed to be you know, uh, the kind of dead and, but they, a sleepy Tam waiting for two guys to go ahead and disrupt it. They create this great brand and these guys, I'm not going to say their numbers, but you yeah. know, billions a month in the COVID era, a very valuable company. So I guess I would, I would create a DTC probably in the CPG space. Cause I think it's yeah. amazing to make a great product that people want to buy and there's yeah. no barrier entry. And when things work out, they have massive exits. So, but I really want, I want to answer that question like five ways. So that's just my number one. I would do, I would do a telemedicine business for sure. <laughs> I'd, find that. I'd find a big category to disrupt. Um, so I, I, I refuse the premise. That I only get one, but I'll just start with yeah. those two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's a lot that can be there's done right now. Every, I mean, everyone has been. So guys, it's a great, uh, anybody out there, men and women, anybody with a dream, it is a yep. great time to be an entrepreneur. And, uh, be bold and be brave. Do not be risk adverse. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. you're a human, you know how to rub two sticks together to make a fire. You'll probably keep yourself warm and feed yourself. You don't have to worry about that. People, people spend so much energy worrying about risk and what they don't worry about is opportunity costs. What could you have been if you only had believed in yourself, right? The, the worst feeling is the regret of looking back about what you could have been, what you knew you could have been and what you didn't go for. Um, so I think that's a greater risk than losing it all any day of the week. I'd rather yeah. die without that regret than uh, lose everything. So that's my, my, my screed for today. I want everybody to you know go for it and consider just setting yeah. aside some risk. And this is a great time to be kind of creative and to be an entrepreneur. Well, on that positive note, uh, Matt, thanks again for your time uh, and for being on the podcast and hopefully we can have you on in the future. Okay. Thanks for having me. Have a great day. I hope you enjoyed this very first episode of the Personal Mastery Podcast. If you're listening on Spotify or iTunes, make sure to follow this podcast and leave us a five-star review. If you're watching on YouTube, leave us a like, comment, and subscribe to this channel for more episodes like this. Thanks for checking out the very first episode of the Personal Mastery Podcast, and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode.